Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Rachel Katz. And one of the things you may have noticed about me already is that I'm a woman studying Grindr. This is often one of the first things people comment on, whether they be fellow Grindr researchers or my own participants, when they hear about the topic of my research. Um, so this has been a starting point of my methodological framework, being an outsider studying in something that I'm not a part of on the everyday. And I was a result of the, this outsider status, um, I've become especially sensitive to some of the ethical issues going on with my research. <clears throat> so firstly, what are dating apps? Grindr is one of many other kinds of dating apps. Um, and I argue that dating apps are distinct from online dating because they are mobile, so you can use them on the go since they're on your smartphone. Um, they're image-based, so you choose people to talk to based on how they look in picture, not how they look, but based on the pictures on their profile. And um, they're location-based, so they show you who's around you based on geolocation. Uh, so these are some stats from Grindr from their own public website. Um, there's an active daily user count of at least 3 million people every day, and they spend an average of 54 minutes per day which is quite a lot of time, I think. Um, but maybe I'm just very busy, I don't know. Um, <coughs> so these stats show that Grindr is the largest all-male gay dating app in the world, and it's grown to become a, a big part of people's everyday lives. Um, so if you've never seen Grindr before, you're about to. Uh, these images all come from Grindr press kits, so they're not um, showing any real people, or real, uh, users, I guess. They're, I assume the models are real people. Um, <laughs> so this is the home screen. As you can see, it's a grid style, um, which is a little bit more old school compared to some of the sleeker, singular image things that happen on apps like Tinder. Um, you can see from the green dots who's online right now in the moment. So the temporal aspect is part of use. Um, and on this app, anyone can talk to anyone who's around, um, rather than having a matching type structure. Um, so if you're interested in going deeper and talking to somebody, you can click on their profile and there's just one picture allowed um, per profile and then there's a little bit of information including, if you can see down here, he's 282 feet away and online now. Um, again, prioritizing the immediacy of the connection and communication. And if you want to chat, that's what the chat looks like. <clears throat> so as you can tell from the title of my talk, um, not only am I studying Grindr, but I'm also studying Grindr tourism in Tel Aviv specifically. So why Tel Aviv and why not somewhere else? Well, firstly, Tel Aviv is a very popular tourist destination um, for all tourists, not necessarily just gay tourists. But addition, in addition to being popular year-round for all tourists, they have Pride every year, which is very popular for international tourists. And in 2017, they had 30,000 tourists come just for Pride. Um, so again, the tourist-local interaction is a big part of everyday life for a lot of people in Tel Aviv. Um, and some of this local tourist interaction takes place on Grindr. So therefore, the nuances of belonging to particular spaces and um, experiencing a foreign space or a local space, uh, it's all negotiated on the app itself. So you can see it's, it's great, okay, Tel Aviv, you know, it's useful for me, but I also hope that it's, my research is useful for the people, the local people in Israel. Um, so what you saw before was a picture of Pride in Jerusalem, and what you see here is a picture of an anti-Pride protest in Jerusalem. Sorry, Pride in Tel Aviv in the slide before. This is an anti-Pride protest in Jerusalem. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple years ago there was a stabbing which resulted in the death of a girl attending one of these parades, and um, there's still a lot of homophobia in certain parts of the country, especially among some of the more religious groups. So. Hopefully, understanding Grindr and seeing how um, it's a part of people's everyday lives, especially everyday gay lives, is of use to the people in the area. Um, okay, so some of the issues with the current literature looking at Grindr tourism, or just Grindr generally, um, can fall into two categories, theoretical or ethical. So some of these theoretical issues um, are the fact that a lot of users, sorry, a lot of researchers so far have been using a community-based approach to study Grindr. So Grindr is the gay community or the global gay community, implying homoge homogeneity um, and a singularity of experience, which may not necessarily be true. Or they use a health-based approach, um, looking at Grindr users as MSM, men who have sex with men, and this is uh, primarily to understand the transmission of HIV potentially through Grindr use. Um, but I argue that these are not really sufficient to understanding what's going on. And 
rather than using either of these two, I use a spatial approach. So when using a spatial approach, traditional understandings of space have fallen into categorizing things as either public or private. You may have heard of this before. But digital landscapes such as Grindr conflate, shift, and overcome these um, standard boundaries of public and private. Uh, so it's not really useful to consider Grindr as community-based or private or public, but rather is bounded in different regimes and norms within spatial layers. Um, so one way this public space perspective has been used in some of the research before is um, taking information directly from profiles, including sometimes in certain autoethnographies, taking chats that that researcher has had personally in their life without the consent of the other party um, and displaying that. So again, this comes from the idea that Grindr is public because anyone can go on Grindr. You can go on and see a home screen even if you um, are a female researcher with an anonymous profile if you'd like. Uh, so that's the logic going there. But we can see already there's kind of a concern because that's not really the purpose of the space of Grindr is to be, isn't really to be looked at. It's for the use for the people there. Um, and some people say, well, it's like social media, right? It's okay to study all social media the same way. Twitter is the same as Grindr and Grindr is the same as Facebook because you can just go on and see. And again, we can see that it's a little more complicated than that. And it's not necessarily even just private because certain aspects of Grindr are public, like the home screen, or more public, I should say. Whereas certain other parts, like the chats, can be private. Um, so a lot of the times, the assumptions of the individual come into play when we kind of think about what's public and private when it comes to use of social media. And it's important to take that into consideration and perhaps even collect that information from your participants if you're setting something like this. Um, so that was the theoretical. Now here are some of the ethical issues, although of course they kind of go together a little bit. Um, so there are issues of the norms of identity and anonymity, especially within the context of Tel Aviv. Um, so here we have a participant talking about um, looking at people on, on a grinder who are in the closet. And he said, obviously people who are in the closet don't want their face on there, and I can respect that. But then I expect them to send me a, to send me a private message with a face. People who will not even do that, I will not speak to, I will block, I want nothing to do with because that's just creepy. And I even dated somebody who was in the closet because of a religious family, so I understand. Um, so this quote illustrates that the norms of space in respect to the home screen anonymity, oh sorry, uh, yeah, um, are different than what's expected in the private message. And so even if you want to be um, discreet and anonymous on the home screen, there's still the norms and expectations that, oh, okay, if you have this identity of being in the closet, you must disclose it to me in this situation, in this other way. Otherwise, the identity shifts, and it's not someone in the closet, it's someone who's creepy, someone who is raising a red flag, um, potentially homophobic, and you know, it's just hard to know what's going on there. So again, there's like a very nuanced experience of what's happening, um, and it's important to take all identities into consideration when we're looking at something like this. Um, so again, these questions confront the, the, you know, I talked about the people posting chat logs and profiles of consent. Um, and one way to resolve this, which now is happening a little bit with Andrew Shields' skeleton profile model, where the person will take uh, information from the dating app profile, like their, their little tagline, you know, um, out late, want to hang or something, and, and their stats, like their identity and uh, information codes from their pictures, and put it in this like uh, standard profile that isn't actually identifying. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can ask me the questions. But again, this comes down to the larger question, is Grindr public? And you can see that hasn't even been addressed, really, in the research at all. Um, and yet, there's been assumptions being made about the space, that it's a community space, or that it's a public space, that go uninterrogated. So this goes to the larger research question here about space. How does Grindr reconfigure spaces and spatial practices, especially within the tourism experience? Um, some of the sub-questions I had looked at if the space of Grindr itself is unique, and if so, in what ways, and how Grindr shapes practices of space in the physical world. Um, so the way I decided on my methods were, was by looking at this question and saying, OK, well, what would an answer to this question look like? How will I know once I've found the right kind of information? Um, and therefore, which methods will tell me that kind of information? Um, so because I'm particularly interested in uh, discovering new or different experiences of space, um, I wanted to kind of capture space as it exists in people's real daily lives. Um, 
And I looked beyond, okay, yeah, direct answers to questions and kind of looked at how people talked about space. So I did a um, multi-method approach. I interviewed people using semi-structured sociological interviews and I also had them complete an audio diary. Um, so some people could opt into the audio diary, so not every participant chose to do that part. But so the, the semi-structured interviews were like any other interview, and the audio diary part um, entailed using uh, WhatsApp video, sorry, audio recording to um, reflect on their use of Grindr that day. And I had a list of prompt questions, and I asked, where were you uh, when you were using Grindr today? Um, did anything unusual happen, that kind of thing. And participants would talk for about two minutes, sometimes more, sometimes a lot more, um, about what was going on that day for a, a week total. And so I could kind of uh, capture some understandings of Grindr as it was being used in real time, like on their commute or how many hours per day and the frequency, um, rather than just hearing about someone's reflections in the interview. Um, so. Yes, um, and I saw that the participants were always on, you know, like T Turkle's notion of being always on social media, always plugged in, it sort of happened that way for them. They'd quickly go on because they were in a new area and they were thinking, well, I'll just keep it open in my pocket and I'll get people to message me while I'm going around that I can come back to later. Um, or they would just say, well, I just checked while I was uh, waiting in line for the food, um, you know, at my, lunch, at my lunch place just to see if anyone had messaged me. And so there'd be these quick moments throughout the day but you, you saw that for most of my participants, it was pretty much constant. Um, so again, is Grindr public or why I didn't recruit my participants through Grindr? So I went pretty old school with my recruitment style um, and I chose not to recruit through Grindr. And part of the reasoning for this was that um, the reason participants go on Grindr, I shouldn't even say participants, the reason why users go on Grindr um, is not to be accosted by researchers to ask them about their experience. And uh, they already complain about having to look at the ads when they go on, on their profiles. So you're, uh, it's kind of invading the space and invading the expected interaction by having a, a recruitment through Grindr using like a research profile or something like that. Um, and so uh, during one of my interviews, I had a participant who was so helpful and he wanted me to have more participants. So he said, hey, have you thought about recruiting through Grindr? And I told him the reasoning why. Um, ethically, I said, you know, it's a little bit of a concern there. And I said, how would you feel if you had seen my research ad um, through Grindr and not the way you did? And he said, oh, you know, actually, I wouldn't really like that so much. So for me, that was really useful that even though he had suggested I do it, he himself also was not excited about the idea of finding out about my research that way. So that kind of reinforced this idea for me. Um, so the way I did recruit, instead of through Grindr, was using a poster. Um, and I distributed this poster online because you'd think, hey, if they're Grindr users, they're on their phones a lot, probably they're on the internet a lot, they're going to see this poster if I post it on the internet. Pretty logical. Uh, so I put it on Twitter, um, Facebook, public Facebook groups, uh, Reddit, public forums, and through newsletters for certain LGBT organizations in the area. Um, I didn't approach anyone directly. I made sure that they came to me, again, for ethical issues because so, so much of this use is private and people might be in the closet. There are lots of things to take into consideration. So like I said, you'd think, okay, this is really effective. Online social media distribution has a huge reach, um, which was true in terms of the numbers of the impressions, but in reality, most of my participants found me because I put up posters all around the city, um, which was very difficult because there are also professional poster people in Israel or in Tel Aviv who put up these other posters you can see for things like concerts or events going on. They have motorcycles and fancy big glue and there's like three of them every 20 minutes and then there's just me with my tape. So it was a bit of a struggle actually and extremely time consuming as a lone researcher in a foreign country. Um, but it still proved to be the most effective. And there's some pretty interesting ideas why. Um, perhaps it was because people were coming into contact with it when they were kind of open to open to that moment rather than when they were had an agenda, perhaps an agenda or something like that while on Grindr. Um, or perhaps it was just um, unusual to see something like that or the English, I don't know, but, but it was more effective with my participants. Um, and I ended up having about 19, I had 19, um, half tourist, half local, uh, from different religious backgrounds. Um, in, among the tourists, but pre pretty homogenous in terms of the locals being mostly Jewish people from Tel Aviv. Uh, but a lot of them were immigrants, at least. Um, so this is 
what it looked like a bit when I was at my field site. Um, you can see that, um, you know, unlike Manchester, where the gay village is fairly so uh, segregated physically, spatially, in Tel Aviv, there's uh, pride flags everywhere. It's a big part of the norm of Israel or of Tel Aviv itself to see um, markers of gay identity and gay pride around and men holding hands and things like that. Again, leading to that impression that tourists have that it's a very um, accepting, wonderful, uh, you know, fantasy cosmopolitan destination to visit. Um, and again, I think this also contributes to the fact that people were open to kind of seeing my poster as they walked around Tel Aviv. So what were the limitations of this method? Um, who is missing from the data? As I talked about before, um, I had some homo homogeneity with my actual participants from um, Tel Aviv area. Uh, and I did try to recruit through areas that were um, Arab, Christian Arab, Muslim Arab, um, African immigrant, but it was not effective. And I think perhaps because the groups are socially segregated to some extent or there's more stigma, there needs to be a unique recruitment for that particular social group, depending on the one you're looking at um, in this particular region of the world. Um, so it's interesting, but unfortunately it's outside of the scope of my research capturing that. Um, additionally, there's the language barrier. Uh, I do not speak Hebrew fluently, unfortunately, so I conducted all of my interviews in English. Um, however, I was interested in speaking with locals who talk to tourists, and usually the lingua franca would be English, and also Grindr, the app itself, is in English, created in the USA. So I felt moderately justified in this, although I do worry that it perhaps dissuaded some people who maybe weren't very confident in their English-speaking ability. Um, but overall, it seemed fine, and none of the participants raised that with me and said, oh, you know, is that a, that's kind of a concern of mine or something like that where they would, they, and they're very open about their concerns, so I wasn't, uh, <laughs> didn't need to worry about whether they were uncomfortable sharing that kind of thing with me. Um, so what is lost when using such a conservative method, uh, you know, so like a ethically, methodologically conservative method to study these dating app technologies, you know, instead of something so cool like what Natalie did with all her data collection, you know, I just went very old school, like I said, um, with my interviews, except for the audio diary part. Um, well, of course, there's not a quantitative measure um, that maybe one could have if one was like scraping the data from the app itself or uh, maybe looking at someone's use in a lab, let's say, and like making, making recordings and things about who they were talking to. Um, but again, and that would capture them in the moment of their use, but then again, of course, there's the <coughs> idea that someone's watching you in a lab maybe would change your behavior, and again, there's the ethical issue of, well, what about the other person on the other side of the conversation that they're speaking to? You know, if they're sending pictures or sending private information, they're not consenting to the research, and you're still capturing that in your thing, in your, in your uh, study, so it's not the best way to go about that either. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, there's some things that are lost, but on the other hand, it's hard to know another way forward with um, you know, digital, meth digital landscapes without being ethically sound. And of course, what is gained? Um, well, there was the, um, again, the ability to uh, access people outside of their grinder use, which was pretty useful. You know, maybe they're more receptive in that case. Um, and there isn't, uh, in the, again, there was a lot of affect captured in the audio diaries. You had an idea of grinder being situated in the outside world. Um, and of course, again, ethical soundness is very important, and that was at least one way to go with this, with you know, um, all things considered. Um, and also, there was a potential lack of access to some spaces due to the fact that I'm a woman, but also no knowledge was assumed. So one example of the lack of access to space I'll go into, although for the most part it wasn't a problem, it was in this particular instance um, that I'll discuss with you now, since we have some time. Um, there we go. So. Um, as I went around putting up my posters in the hot blazing sun, uh, some people said, oh, have you tried uh, going to the gay beach to recruit people there? So I said, oh, no, you know, let me do that. Um, and I went to this gay beach, which I had never been to before. And it used to be a cruising spot, but now it's become very known. You know, all the tourists come, they want to go to this gay beach just because it's the gay beach and there's, you know, rainbow. Uh, you can see rainbow cabanas here. and. It's just a little bit um, of a, I guess, novelty among a very large stretch of beach that is pretty much the same. So I went there thinking, okay, maybe I can put them, uh, put the posters up in some of these restaurant areas and maybe like in the bathrooms or something. Um, but actually, there wasn't really anywhere to put it up, which was disappointing. And secondly, as I was coming down, I was told it was a gay beach, like, 
Um, usually when you go to a lot of these gay establishments, like commercial establishments like gay bars and things, it's a, gen a mixed gender group. And I went and nobody told me it was going to be an all male space, but um, when I went it was all pictures of male couples, well not pictures, all male couples uh, on the beach and I was the only woman in that section of it. So I um, felt a little bit uncomfortable. I felt like I was kind of like ogling a little bit or, or kind of invading in the space as a woman. So instead I went to go sit at um, what they, it was called the family beach next to it. And again, just to show you how assimilated um, gay life is in Israel, it's not like this, this was sort of a taboo thing at all because what you can't see, but behind here there's a big playground for children and then there's a family beach right, right over here. Um, so it's all kind of together. They share the bathrooms between these two beaches. They're not really that different, but one has the rainbow cabana, so that, that's what makes it the gay beach. Um, and so I sat with the family beach where there were families and people of mixed gender groups and I sort of watched for a bit and I was reflecting on my feelings and I was thinking, you know, I just feel so uncomfortable accessing this space and I wish I, I could, you know, maybe this would be a great time to like have people chat to me and then I could just tell them about my research because there you can just go and people will talk to you even if you don't approach them, they're interested, oh, who's this foreigner you know, sitting here on the beach, let me get the story. Um, but that didn't happen and again, I was really aware of my outsider status in that moment um, about the difficulties using these methods to connect with my participants. Oh yeah, there we go, there's the picture. Okay, so here's the rainbow cabanas stretching that way. Lifeguard, um, jungle gym, playground, and then this is the family beach. So that was kind of me, again, creepily ogling um, and really feeling a lot of doubt about that aspect of my approach and my research. Um, so some of my concluding thoughts on this whole uh, project having, after having completed my field work. Um, is that uh, Tel Aviv is a very unique field site. Grindr is a very unique digital landscape. It's very interesting to study them together, but um, it's also very important to tread with caution and keep in mind the phrase, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I thought that was the best way to go forward ethically in terms of my approach, um, and I think it's a good way forward toward the studying of digital technologies, um, especially as it's the sort of wild west of ethics, and it seems to be very platform specific for what's right and what's wrong. Um, and finally, you can see that it's important, you know, not only am I looking at Grindr as a space, uh, as just my interest, theoretical interest to studying Grindr as my main project, but also it's important to study space in digital landscapes methodologically because that's so important to framing how you ethically approach these things. So hopefully my research will end up being of use not only theoretically but also methodologi methodologically. Um, and it will help uh, shift and shape approaches to Grindr in the future. Thank you.